Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you to the Thinking Differently CFI series of Unexpected Conversations session. My name is Barb Spurrier. I have the honor of serving as the Associate Administrator of the Center for Innovation. So, so happy you could be with us today. Um, our Center for Innovation started the speaker series back in 2011. And uh, our speaker today is the 12th uh, over the last few years. We welcome presenters who help us think differently and increase our understanding of human-centered design, creativity, and innovation. A major goal of our speaker series is to facilitate opportunities to learn from outside experts and introduce new and diverse perspectives to Mayo Clinic. Today we have the awesome privilege to welcome a true innovator, Nancy Lyons. And a word about Nancy in just a moment. Before we do that, we have a whole team of innovators, I know right here in the room, and also from the Women Presidents Organization, or the WPO. We were connected to Nancy by our colleague, Myrna Morofsky, who's right here. So Myrna, raise it, there we go, there's Myrna. Uh, and our WPO uh, colleagues, just if you could show your hands, who are here with us today. The WPO is a nonprofit membership organization for women presidents of multi-million dollar companies. The members of the WPO take part in professionally facilitated peer advisory groups in order to bring the genius of the group and accelerate the growth of their businesses. The organization helps to improve business conditions for women entrepreneurs and to promote the acceptance and advancement of women entrepreneurs in all industries around the world. The members of WPO have an average of over $13 million in annual revenue. If you look at all of the members around the world, there's over $20 billion in their organizations. On average, 92 employees, on average, 24 years in business. There are currently 100 and chapters of the WPO in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Peru, the UK, Sweden, Portugal, Turkey, the Middle East, North Africa, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. And what's really awesome is we have the most chapters in the state of Minnesota, more here than any other location in the world. So go Minnesota, huh? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and we have a number of those chapters represented today. So we've had the great honor over the last couple of years to connect with the WPO. In fact, this afternoon, a number of uh, women leaders from Mayo Clinic will have the awesome opportunity to connect with our WPO members and have a great conversation about uh, how we're thinking about the transformation of our industries, human-centered design, innovation, all kinds of things. So really, really, really excited to welcome the WPO here today. Um, earlier this year, Lorna Ross, who's the design strategist of the CFI and myself, had the opportunity to present at the WPO Annual Leadership Conference in Arizona. Uh, Lauren and I worked together to share a couple of workshops in human-centered design in our journey of innovation here at Mayo. And that was just an incredible opportunity. So now to move on to our guest of honor today, and that is Nancy Lyons, the president and CEO of Clockworks. So just a couple of things about Nancy. Nancy works at the intersection of technology, community, and people. As a leader and a technologist, she creates solutions that further community and business goals by meeting the needs of the individual. Her guiding philosophy is that a human-centered approach to technology is the only way to get results that truly will make a difference. Problem solving is about empowerment, motivated people create good products. She supports clients and teams by fostering collaboration and so many great things that you'll learn about in just a moment. Nancy speaks extensively about work culture, entrepreneurship, social media, technology and leadership. She's been locally and nationally recognized for her role. She's co-author of Interactive Project Management, Pixels, People and Process. She serves as the Vice Chair of the National Board of Directors 
of the Family Equality Council. She's on the Board of Trustees for Minnesota Public Radio. She's a member of the advisory board for the Innovative Entrepreneurial Conference called Giant Steps. Under Nancy's leadership, Clockwork has received so many Best Workplace Awards. It's so exciting to go out and see all these awards and the videos and all kinds of things. Clockwork has won the Healthy Workplace Best Woman-Owned Business Bicycle Friendly Business Award. Independently, Nancy received the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal Diversity and Business Award, was a finalist in the Minnesota Business Magazine's Community Impact Award. In June of 2014, Nancy spoke on the structure of the workplace at the inaugural White House Summit for Working Families in Washington, D.C. Nancy is guided by a few simple but telling mottos to think strategically, to act thoughtfully, and to be a good human. She has many obsessions, and some are laughter, music, theater, social justice, family equality, good books, good friends, her family, and breathing. So please join me in welcoming Nancy Lyons. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, that, that bio was a nightmare, and I'm going to burn it. Immediate. But thank you for reading it. Thank you for your patience in my bio. I don't know where it came from. Um, thanks for having me today. I appreciate uh, the invitation. I appreciate Myrna recommending me. I hope, I hope Myrna's still my friend when we're done here today. Um, so my company is Clockwork, and we're based in Minneapolis. There's about 70 of us. We work out of an old service station in northeast Minneapolis. And um, most people think that when I show up for events like this, I'm going to talk about technology and how technology is changing all of us. And it is. It is changing us. But I've started to tell different stories. And they're all about work, because Clockwork um, has received some interesting uh, notoriety as a result of how we work. And how we, worked, how we work has been entirely influenced by technology, by what's happening on the internet, internet thinking and how it's changed people and culture. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about that um, and some attention that we received and some stories that I like to tell. But first, I think it's important for us to kind of look at, um, and I'm sorry, my presenter notes are over here. Um, I, I don't know how that happens, so I'm going to look away from you often. Um, I will not be making eye contact in those moments. Take notes, this is not what you should do when you speak in public. A perfect example of what not to do. So a brief history of innovation. So the universe showed up, huh? <laughs> 10 billion years ago. And we figured fire out, arguably, something like what? One million years ago? I said it was gonna be brief, I promise. <laughs> Electricity as we know it was discovered 300, roughly 300 years ago. And we started talking about network computers 50 years ago. And BBSs and really, really bad websites proliferated the internet, what, 20 years ago? And then about five years ago, we got enamored with things like geolocation. Y'all know what geolocation is, right? It's how we can find things with mapping applications on our phones, or our friends can find us, or we can locate stolen devices. That was only just five years ago. So we went from millions of years between culture shifting activity to just a few years. 50 years, 20 years, to cultures changing discoveries that aren't really showing any signs of slowing down. So right now, at this moment in time, digital isn't only a dominant business or industry, it basically dominates every single business and every aspect of other industries. It's central to everything we're doing. Retail, entertainment, hospitality, business to business, consumer packaged goods, and healthcare. There isn't an industry that hasn't been touched by digital, if only by having a website. 
So this ubiquity combined with the tech industry moving quickly and the fact that it feels like anything is possible is all very distracting. We think about the gadgets. Humans are weird. We're trout. We like shiny objects, right? So when we think about technology, we think about the stuff. We want to be early adopters. There's a badge of honor that comes along with having the new iPhone, the new thing. We think about what's possible. We think about all the ways that technology is going to change us. Except technology on its own doesn't really do much. Geolocation and push notification and wearables, we can't stop talking about the stuff. Or what might be possible if we just wait a year. But the truth about technology is this. It's not about the stuff at all. It's not about those things. It's not about the gadgets. It's about people. It's about humans. People make it. People use it. No matter what we're thinking of, building, promoting, advocating for, when it comes to technology, people have to be at the center of it. What experience do you want to create? How do you want people to feel about the applications, about the technology that they're using? How should they feel? How can you make their lives better? So in my business, we're doing a lot to refocus the conversation, and it is hard. People come through the door every day, and they're like, I need an app. What do you need an app for? I have no idea. <laughs> I need an app because everybody else has an app. Therefore, I should have an app. It should change all things, and it should be $4. <laughs> we have to refocus the conversation away from the brain, and we try to do this, away from the brain and instead into the body and the heart. We have to shift attention from the stuff, and we have to refocus the attention on the people who use it. So I tried to think about the correlations between what you do and what we do. And oddly, there are a lot. So there's a lot of overlaps between technology and healthcare. So we solve problems for people. We solve big problems for people. And we have to think creatively and execute tactically. Our industries are constantly changing, right? New information and knowledge and hardware, it all emerges daily. And we, as the experts, as the specialists, we are required to keep up with it. And it's moving at the speed of sound. Many of our interactions with clients on our end, right, with patients on yours, are stressful and really hard. Because people, right, people, they're hard. In technology, we're dealing with people who are trying to execute a big mandate, some sort of big corporate initiative. And they're really stressed out about getting it right. There's a lot of money on the line. They're spending all sorts of budget on new software, and they're hoping that their needs meet their organization's objectives. Or their aging and managing technology project amplifies their fears of being irrelevant and outdated. People don't like to feel that way. They don't like to be put in a corner. So these are just some of the similarities. There's also parallels around people and how we relate to each other and how we relate to the people we're helping. Many of these parallels highlight the gaps, gaps between people or how people are perceiving situations that we frequently find ourselves in. So in our world, and I know in your world, because oddly, I have been a patient. There is a language barrier. Both technology and healthcare have very specific and specialized languages. Terminology that requires education or onboarding on the part of the client or the patient. In fact, I checked this out. I was intrigued. On Amazon, you can actually find a book titled, it sounds really, really riveting too, Medical Language, and it's 1,100 pages long, <laughs> which suggests just how complex and vast your language system is. Not only this, but the specific language, the specific languages are second nature to the technicians or the specialists who speak it. 
You guys have spent years in your field. This is what you do. This is how you talk. I've spent years writing code. I could actually speak in code if I chose to. And just shut this talk right down. <laughs> We're proud of what we know. People are proud of what we've achieved. We're proud, but we're entrenched. And oftentimes, we're unaware of how dense and specific our knowledge is. So there's this imbalance between the specialists who have the knowledge and the people who are looking to the specialists for help. This isn't news to you, I recognize. That imbalance creates, well, sometimes distrust, which is the worst case scenario, or just a general question as to whether you can trust the information you're getting. If I don't understand the language, I can't trust the information I'm getting. So not distrust, not actually trust, more like ambiguity. It's similar to how many people feel when they go to the auto parts store or the auto shop and they get their car fixed. You know when you get your oil changed and they walk up to you with that dirty air filter and they say, would you like to spend 25 extra dollars to get your air filter replaced? And it looks dirty and you don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> and you think, okay, it's just 25 bucks. I'll do that. And you get your air filter changed. Why? Right? Why? You have no idea, and there's no easy way to find out. One thing in our business can affect every other thing. Everything else in very intricate and complicated ways, and it's not always easy to figure out what that one thing was. Technology systems are immensely complicated. Like the human body, if you change one small detail, like one character in a line of code that you will never ever find, it can affect the entire system. You can shut down whole organizations with one single human error, and you'll never find that human error. This makes the things we build more fragile than they appear, more confusing. And I'm sure everybody in medicine can absolutely relate to that. Prescription chemistry, compliance, diet, activity, genetics, these all contribute to the human system in which one, can, one single change can affect everything else. And like technology systems, it's not always, or maybe it's not ever, easy to pinpoint the one thing that changed and why it impacted every other thing. So if technology and healthcare can both be emotionally stressful or imbalanced or sometimes confusing and wildly intricate, how do patients, and in our case, how do clients feel about human mistakes or failures? Now in my business, we have to say out loud when we make a mistake. In your business, I don't know how that works. I honestly don't. In my business, <clears throat> Our clients tend to have really low tolerance for failure. And yet, let's keep it to ourselves. It's a secret. We'll keep it in this room. The weird part about people is they screw up. They screw up all the time. And it doesn't matter how much education or how much experience you have. You are going to make mistakes. And failure is super stressful because we don't always understand the problem or how something went wrong, and it's hard to swallow that maybe the experts don't actually know something, or they don't know it right away, or they don't know what went, what went wrong. We think if we're paying for something, you don't get to say, I don't know. And yet, information is moving so quickly that I don't know is part of the job. So shifting from the people we're working for to the people we're working with, that's us and each other, some of the very same parallels exist because we often work with people outside of our immediate discipline or our specialty area. So language barriers and differing perspectives, personal pride and personal fear, we're going back to that being human thing, are all part of what individuals bring to team dynamics and collaborations. We've all seen it and we've all felt it. We've all done it. These dynamics make it hard to work really well together, even when you share the same objectives. So what's going to close those gaps? Steve Jobs, you've heard of him. 
He said that his company, and I'm a huge fan of his company, lived at the intersection of technology and liberal arts. To Jobs, liberal arts was another name for the humanities, the encapsulation of poetry, prose, art, music, of what the ancient Greek philosophers called the just, the beautiful, and the good. And the word technology here could be replaced with any industry. Because the best innovations, both socially and economically, come from the pursuit of ideals that are timeless and are human. Joy and wisdom, beauty, truth, equality, community, sustainability, and I'm going to say it, and love. Love in the workplace. So humanity, love in the workplace. We're going there today, people. <laughs> we are going there. This is going to get awkward. You're going to need more water. So humanity, what does that really mean? So I use the iPad app WordFlex. Anybody used it? It's fun. It's fun if you're a nerd. So if you use it, we see a word association map of words and phrases related to the word humanity. As a whole, it starts to show us what we mean when we talk about humanity. Super fun if you're a nerd. If we look more closely at the wing outlining the characteristic, we see words not always associated with a professional space. Kindness and sympathy and gentleness, love, I'm going there, and yet, this is what being human and being a whole human at work looks like. Let's look more closely at what humanity as a characteristic looks like. Tenderness, touching, oh. <laughs> and I have big issues with touching, so I don't know what the hell I think I'm doing up here, even saying the word. If you Google tenderness, nearly every image shows people or animals touching. Touching is an integral part of how we relate, how we react, and how we respond to other humans. Talking about touching with any kind of professional engagement in any kind of professional environment feels risky. And we're all kind of scared of it. And I totally get that. I already admitted I have issues with touching. But we have to think more humanly about our work and our workspace and our work relationships. Stay away from lawsuits, but we can be more present and connected while being professional. So social scientists have shown in many studies, and you've all read these, we've all been exposed over the years, that supportive touch can have good outcomes in a number of different realms. So consider the following examples. If a teacher touches a student on the arm or on the back, the student is more likely to participate in class. The more athletes high-five and hug, and God knows I wonder why they do this whenever I watch a sporting event, but they do it because they do better in the game. A touch can make patients like their doctors more, and if you touch a bus driver, he might actually let you get on the bus for free. <laughs> now, I waited tables for years and years, and it was common knowledge in the, in the service industry that if you touch a patron on the arm, you're likely to get a bigger tip. If you walk up to them, you put your hand on their arm, and you say, is everything all right? Right after they've taken a mouthful, mind you. That's also well known in the industry. That's, that's how you time it. Hand-holding or hugging results in a decrease of the, and I'm not telling you people anything you don't already know, a decrease in that stress hormone that plagues me, cortisol, in addition to calming us down and reducing our stress response, a friendly touch also increases a release of what? Oxytocin, also called the cuddle hormone, who knew, which affects trust behaviors. Touching makes people like each other. It makes them work better together, it makes them more generous, and it makes them open to participation. So I found this in the Harvard, Harvard Business Review. 
of, of a blindfolded study, participants understood nonverbal emotional communication. This was a 2009 study. Participants tried to communicate dis eight distinct emotions, anger, fear, disgust, love, gratitude, sympathy, happiness, and sadness to another participant who was blindfolded. The blindfolded partner was able to pick up on those nonverbal communications 78% of the time. So compassion, these are similar characteristics. They both require us to consider another person on an emotional, what are they feeling, what are they going through, and psychological, how are they understanding or not understanding level. So research by the Perth Leadership Institute and Harvard University shows that most people have this status quo bias. Do you know what that is? The definition of a status quo bias is an emotional bias. We have a preference for the current state of affairs. So you all know what this is like. How many of you love change? Let's change everything. I embrace change. Bring change to work. Bring change to our teams because darn we're good at change. Nobody is. Nobody is. A preference for the current state of affairs, the current baseline or status quo is taken as a reference point and any change from that baseline is perceived as a loss. So we can see from the definition that this works against innovation or new ideas because they might fail. They might be risky. They're new. We don't like failure. We don't like change. We don't like new. So always going against the status quo, which is what innovation sort of requires, may also be perceived as a loss. Compassion, like caring for other people, eliminates the fear and the anxiety. Workspaces. Work is not safe to fail. It's not safe to fail at work. They just don't go together. Compassion eliminates the fear and anxiety associated with going against the norm. It makes people feel secure and supported. It removes or reframes that status quo. So recently I was asked to speak at a creative summit in Iowa. Who knew they're creative in Iowa? <laughs> I was speaking at this event and prior to the event I, I did a, an Iowa public radio show and um, I participated in this discussion and one of my co-participants was a woman by the name of Seagal Barsa Barsade. And she's a professor of uh, management at the Wharton School. So she just completed this longitudinal study that looked at love in the, you know her, you know her, you know her, she's awesome. She's gonna, we're gonna hang out, me and, me and Seagal. Um, <laughs> we are, I called her right afterwards, I was like, you talked about love. She talked about love in the workplace. Not romantic love, but companionate love. Companionate love is based on warmth and affection and connection, not passion. And it's experienced between friends and colleagues and peers rather than partners or family. So the study tried to better understand the impact of this kind of love. And they explored the influence that emotional culture has on employee, employee patient, and family outcomes. After studying colleagues within industries from healthcare to finance to real estate, they found that people who worked in a culture where they feel free to express affection, tenderness, caring, and compassion for one another were more satisfied with their jobs, more committed to the organization, and more accountable for their performance. Emotional culture. Based on the study results, one aspect of work culture that Barsad emphasized for success was a focus on emotional culture. Emotional culture is what you're supposed to, what you're supposed to express and repress at work when the boss is not around. This complements cognitive culture, which is typically what workplaces focus on. What you're supposed to think when the boss isn't around. This includes your values, your behaviors, your mores. Being kind, acting with your heart instead of your head, giving credit to other people, raising other people up, supporting them, all of that disarms people. It throws them off. It makes you vulnerable. 
which is really uncomfortable. But in doing that, you let other people be vulnerable. And vulnerability opens the door for innovation. It's hard, but it pays off. So this is a quote from a story. So three months ago, I started talking to the folks here as a result of Myrna hooking us up. And a week and a half ago, and I, and I gave them my title and my description. We, we sort of workshopped it through a couple of calls. And a week and a half ago, I found an article on the Harvard Business Review titled, Innovation Starts with the Heart, Not the Head. I think I'm on to something. I should have written an article. The author recounts the experience of the CEO whose hospitals were ranking low in the bottom 25 to 50% in patient satisfaction surveys. And he knew things had to change, but he had no money. So he presented his staff with this challenge, bring your heart to work in new and creative ways. He wanted patients to know that the hospital not only cared for patients, but also cared about them. And he wanted the patients to walk away having felt that. Everything changed after the staff started to find those creative ways to live up to this challenge. Not only did the system rank in the top 95% within three months, but the CEO reported that the healing relationships that they created generated a relaxation response, lowered blood pressure, improved the happy neurotransmitters, reduced pain, and improved outcomes for both the patient and the caregiver. As the author observes, if you want to innovate, you need to be inspired. Your colleagues need to be inspired, and ultimately your customers have to be inspired. So how do we at Clockwork, and this is what I got asked to show up at the White House and talk about, uh, bring humanity into the workplace? We're a technology company. Culture with a culture that enables and encourages and even requires that we each bring our whole selves to work. And one in which the traditional work-life balance, those divisions, they have no meaning. They're not valuable. Whether we're talking about an entire company or a department or a team or a collaborative group, the culture that's expected and the culture that's lived by is created by everyone and centered around the conditions for human-centered thinking. So I'm going to show you a little, a little story. This, we, got a, we got some attention. We've all probably wondered if there's any such thing as a perfect job, so we sent NBC's Cynthia McFadden on the road in search of it. And what she found at one family-friendly office in Minneapolis may just redefine work-life balance as we know it. Imagine a job where no one worried about when you walk in, where you can bring your kids to work whenever you want. Potluck chili is what's for lunch, and ice cold beers always on tap. But wait, it gets even better. Do they keep track of how much vacation time you take? They don't care how much vacation time they take as long as we're getting the work done. Welcome to Clockwork in Minneapolis, a place where no one seems to watch the clock. When we drove up, the taxi said to me, look, they're having a party in there. <laughs> I think that's what people think from the outside looking in. Look, we work really hard. 13 years ago, with a little money, a couple of friends, and a lot of Midwestern pluck, Nancy Lyons took an old gas station and turned her dream into a tech company. You know, I'm a woman with a, with a mouth and big ideas. Entrepreneurism was the path I had to take. And I wanted people who wanted to do the work and who wanted to have some fun. Today, she has 75 employees and is expanding. If you look on our website, it says, we like Mondays, and it's true. Her army of geeks help other businesses figure out their digital strategies. Target, Best Buy, and General Mills are among their clients. Hold it a second. Hello. But it's how they treat their employees here that has everyone talking. I've been working for a while in lots of different places, and this is the best place I have ever worked. Oh, no, he's going that way. I always say it's not work-life balance. It's life balance. It's all life. We bring our work home. We bring our lives to work. All right, so a cynic might say, okay, really all this family-friendly stuff is just a way to keep them here longer and make them more productive. Sure, it works to the company's advantage often, and it works to the staff's advantage often too. 
Who cares about the soda? If you don't feel good where you work, and if you don't believe what leadership is saying to you, no can of Coke is going to fix that for you. The secret sauce isn't so secret. It boils down, it seems, to respect. Every person I talk to here says, it's the best place I've ever worked. Yeah. What, what, what does it do when you hear people say that? Oh, I get choked up. Yeah. Because that's what I wanted. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Little wonder Nancy Lyons is being asked to consult with other companies all over. So I shared that with you because it's the best thing that's ever happened to me, let's be honest. <laughs> Um, but I shared it with you because while that NBC story was awesome, um, they focused on the perks or what I like to call the gimmicks, the things that people show when they show technology companies on the television. Um, it's the foosball tables, right? Because God knows I took my last job because of the foosball table. When I pick a place to work, I'm going to pick it because there's beer on tap. I, I, don't, I don't think so. There's so many more important elements to our human-centered culture that fuel and support those superficial perks that we're so uncomfortable talking about. But while we're comfortable talking about all of these things, the beer, FYI, we are not drunk 24-7. <laughs> And it's funny because I did an interview on Australian TV as a result of this one, and they could not fathom that we weren't drunk all the time. And I, I was like, you're an adult. Conceivably, you could get liquor whenever you want it. You could be drunk right now, ma'am. And I'm assuming you're not because you value your job. We value our job, too. The beer isn't why people choose us. Perks don't truly affect why people want to work somewhere. Ping pong and scooters and free lunch. A healthy culture isn't about any of that. Culture is fuzzier and less specific. And yet, you know it when you feel it. So, what do we do in my business? What do you do at the Center for Innovation? What is everybody talking about and trying to figure out in really tangible ways? If you're not a designer, how do you think about what we do every day, which is user-centered design? When we build products for our clients, we are thinking about what do they need? How do we want them to feel when they interact with this product? What do we want it to solve? What problem do we want it to solve? How do we address areas of pain? We employ what we call user-centered design. And if you look at Wikipedia, user-centered design is a philosophy in which the needs, wants, and limitations of end users of an interface or document are given extensive attention at each stage of the design process. So let's think about, let's think about designing a culture for people and implying some of that very same thinking. So a human-centered culture is a philosophy in which the needs and the wants and the limitations of humans, and God knows they need things. As an owner of a company, you are always thinking about what do they need? What do they want? Because they want so much. They want so much and limitations. We don't talk enough about the limitations of humans and yet they have them and they make mistakes and they hit a wall and they don't know things. Every level of the organization, these kinds of human issues exist and we like to think about all of them. So translated to a work environment, this means placing people at the center of everything we do every decision we make. It means embracing and acting with humanity in all situations. If culture is the attitudes and characteristics of a particular group, everyone from the founder to the newest hire, from our engineers to sales teams, they have to have a shared attitude and, and shared characteristics that prioritize humans. So empathy and understanding are valued. Conversations are valued. Whole selves are brought to the table. And you know what that means? Sometimes work is ugly. Sometimes people disappoint you. Sometimes they cry. Sometimes they lose it a little bit. And that's OK. Not all the time, just a little bit. This approach encourages life simply by being more human. 
So culture at work is cultivated between leadership and staff, colleagues, the experts, the non-experts. It's experienced and cultivated within many relationships and dynamics at the office. Internally and externally, culture seeps into every single conversation and interaction with anyone inside of the organization and anyone else. If there are expectations of how these interactions should feel to everybody, there is a greater opportunity to work well together. A human-centered culture shifts the dynamics and reduces the gaps through empathy and connection. So culture has to be deliberate. And I think it's often an afterthought. We think, especially as entrepreneurs, that culture just happens. You plant a little seed, you have a little attitude, and culture just happens. We write business plans, we write marketing plans. I've never met anybody who's written a culture plan, who has fully articulated how a culture should feel, ever, and yet, it's necessary and valuable. Organizations and teams spend far more time on business strategy or financial plans without ever thinking about culture. I think we should sit down and determine what it's supposed to feel like when you go to work. That's kind of fuzzy, but it's really valuable. How are you going to eliminate the tendency to not bring your whole self to work? Are you going to be in a place where people feel good and supported, where all the humans, including the people that don't understand the language you feel, feel included, not excluded? Why culture and why should we care about it? because a healthy culture serves people and serves business. Recent articles, and you can't get away from them, they're everywhere. Titles like Reduce Fear to Create a Calmer, More Productive Workplace from the New York Times, and The Secret to an Efficient Team is Gratitude from 99U start to suggest that, hey, we need to care, but we need to be mindful and we need to be holistic about it. Better culture means better people, means better work, means better business. So putting people first creates a place where people can thrive, where people feel good. Happy people do good work. They're more committed to their work and their workplaces. Happy people's needs are met. Happy people care about each other and the work. But what actually makes people happy? Well, we know that Daniel Pink wrote this book and everybody read it, right? And he distilled that sort of happiness in the workplace down to these three points. Autonomy, they want to know that they have control over time, their schedules, the technique, maybe their teams. They want to own something. They want mastery. They want to get better. They want to be an expert, but they want to continually be challenged. And they want purpose. They want to be a part of something bigger. So how do you as an organization create a culture that encourages all of that? So there are those uh, Forbes top 100 companies, and I know that data is always important when you're talking fuzzy stuff like this, so here's your data. Um, uh, on those Forbes top 100 companies, what we sort of discovered was that uh, those that get respect from their leaders reported 56% better health and well-being, um, more trust and safety, greater enjoyment and satisfaction with their jobs, greater focus and prioritization, um, more meaning and significance. And sometimes, and here's the thing, sometimes work is just work. And let's be honest with each other. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter how accomplished you are. There are days when you get out of bed and work just sucks. And you can't take that away. It'll never go away. But if we're mindful of how people feel and how we're contributing to that, you can make it better. You can engage them more. You can make them feel more included. So you could replace respect on this slide with just about anything, gratitude, recognition, any other free things that stem from cultivating a healthy work culture. So the co positive culture pays, according to that Wharton School, uh, companies on Fortune Magazine's annual list of the 100 best companies to work for in America between 98 and 2005 returned 14% per year compared to 6% a year for the overall market. In 2013, revenues increased by an average of 22.2% for the 2014 Fortune 100 best companies to work for. And the crazy thing is only 19% of people in America report actually feeling engaged at work. 
actually feeling like they care, actually feeling like they have a culture that is supportive of them. So that's 81% of people that feel like their jobs are horrid. And we, use, we lose $300 billion a year in the United States in lost productivity. So what do we do to engage people at work? Well, I use this word often, and I'm not ashamed. We decide what's sacred to us, and we give everybody a voice in what's sacred. Yes, we have our values and we live our values, but what are those things that we hold space for that must always be? It begins with the leadership, but it includes everyone. There are things that are meaningful and sacred and they don't ever change, not with the trends or when new leaders come in. They are long lasting, they are upheld, and because of the sacred, the organization and the people take them to heart because they are lived and they are breathed. And, every, and we do it crazy. We pull out a whiteboard every year and we revisit what, what is sacred to us, what, is, what cannot change. Yes, it's the Babies at Work program. Actually, there were no babies that day. We had no babies because there weren't a lot of babies, but they said, hey, we want to illustrate what it's like to have babies at work. Can you get some babies? So I called people and said, can I borrow your baby? Because <laughs> it's NBC, it's Cynthia McFadden, for God's sake. You do what she asks. People who fit the culture are brought on to teams and projects. The organization and managers realize it's not just about job skills. Job skills are table stakes. Google, when they hire people, they favor ability over experience. That represents their values translated into an actionable hiring process. The values and culture must be transparently communicated to establish shared expectations and mutual understanding. So a human-centered culture isn't, isn't a closed, exclusive system. And we as humans like things to be exclusive. We want to feel like we're in the know and you're not. We're the special ones and you're not. I got picked for this and you didn't. And that is not a human-centered workplace. <clears throat> Emotional intelligence, we talk a lot about it, but we have to know what it is and what it means. In our business, IQ is highly valued. In your business, IQ is highly valued. But it's not the it anymore. What is the it is how we read people. It's necessary, this emotional intelligence for every interaction with people, period. And if we are building products for people, I can't let the nerds in the basement be the ones to build them anymore. I have, right? I mean, back in the, I've been doing this for 20 years. Back in the day when there were me and three other coders on the planet, I mean, according to mainstream media, it, we would let engineers build products for people that they had never met, that they had never engaged with, that they had never talked to. And what happened? Those products failed. And in fact, all technology failed when we did it that way. Do you remember? Do you remember how we overvalued the technology and we weren't talking enough about the people? And what happened? We called it the dot bomb, right? We all saw it. And then we got smarter about building tools for people. In healthy cultures, emotional intelligence is outwardly valued as a crucial part of the set of skills that staff is expected to bring to work. Now here's the thing, most humans are terrible at tough conversations. And confrontation is a difficult thing. In your business, I imagine you have to tell people things they don't want to hear every single day. Here's the crazy correlation. In my business, I have to tell people things they don't want to hear every single day. And it's usually, actually, that's not $4. Or, we're not going to meet your deadline. Or, this isn't going to make all your dreams come true. Or, we considered these features incorrectly and we have to rethink them. Here's the thing. We grew up in a service-based culture, right? Where the customer is always right and you never tell them no. And as a result of that, we as customers or patients have unrealistic expectations. And business people are bad at telling the truth. We're bad at it. 
because we don't want to upset anybody. But what's changing when we consider this human-centered shift is the need to be honest at all costs. We must. We must. Good cultures will support challenging topics like sexism, like racism. We have to. We're terrified to talk about it. We leave it to HR. HR, I'm sorry, I know you're in the room. I love you. I'll hug you later. But HR inside of organizations has become about protecting the organization and uh, from litigation and not supporting the humans that do the work. So what's missing there? We're so afraid of confronting real issues that we just don't. So when we were kids, we did this weird thing. You know, our parents, you're all, I mean, I'm assuming there's a lot of parents in the room. I'm a parent. What do we do for our children? We nurture, we affirm, we set limits. They turn 18, it all stops, right? The only limits are legal, and then you go to jail if you break the law, so whatever. Right? But in the workplace, it's equally as important to think about the necessity for nurturing those people and their big brains and their great talent. Affirming that talent and setting limits, you also need to cultivate a sense of ownership. They have to feel like they're a part of something bigger, and everybody owns the promises that the whole organization makes. Innovation requires a lot of collaboration, information, and knowledge sharing, and good old-fashioned getting along. But that doesn't mean that everything is butterflies and rainbows, right? Because what did I say earlier? There are days when work will simply suck. And there's nothing we can do about it. Human-centered culture encourages the whole self. That means all the good stuff and all the bad stuff. It's all the truth. And that makes for more intimate connections, which bring more personal dynamics. So how do we leverage that? How do we make it an asset rather than a liability? We have to follow some golden rule type thinking. So we have to hire excellent people. One of the questions I asked in my tour at the Center, of Innovation, Center for Innovation today was, how do you hire people? We hire people the exact same way. It is rigorous. It is rigorous. They have to match your values. They have to match that profile. You have to put people in front of the people they're going to work with. They have to experience the chemistry that they're going to work with. And it's hard. Getting one more customer is never worth sacrificing the culture or the people that work there. And starting those conversations right away in the interview process is really important. Communicating openly. Speak their language. We are a weird, weird culture where we like to show what we know. Show what you know. Speak over them. They don't need to be there with you. You're the one who knows. But we can't. We can't afford to anymore. One of the reasons why I think that I've had success in the tech space is because I speak in plain English. And you know what? That's super valuable in technology. Super valuable. Because of those nerds in the basement that don't speak English. <laughs> and no one, no one wins when communication is fuzzy, when you don't, both don't understand each other. Because you'll either have to go back and disappoint them later or work your people so hard that the product won't be nearly as good when it's all done. I think listening is something that we're all just bad at. We live in a culture of people that are dying to be heard, so we're waiting for our next chance to talk, and we're not listening well. And making a friend is super important. Do you use that word love at work? We're talking about companionate love versus loneliness at work, because loneliness at work actually compromises the quality of the end product. We all need just one friend, just one friend at work to feel that human connection that makes us far more productive and engaged. And I'll tell you this, the reason that that NBC News story happened is because we all like each other. Every single one of us, we all say that. We all say that. This is the only place I've ever been where I would hang out with any one of those people. But you know what else I would do? I would put any single human being I work with at a table with a client anytime. Anytime. There is no B team. There is no C team. We all respect and care for each other. <clears throat> Practice gratitude. We all know about those experiments that suggest that people respond better when you thank them. Thanking is very important, but it's not just for leaders. It's for all of us. 
thanking the people we work with every single day. Treat everyone like the expert. In fact, if there has to be an idiot, it has to be you. <clears throat> there is no us versus them. And never make a decision in a vacuum. I think collaboration is something we talk a lot about, but we're not necessarily all that great at. And part of that is because of the nature of decision making. Human-centered thinking means you treat yourself as human. That means knowing and accepting that you have strengths and you have weaknesses. Own that and see others with the same sort of compassion. It serves no one to go off in a room and do your own thing and come back with a big reveal. One of those move that bus moments. It doesn't serve anybody because they aren't there, they're not along for the ride, and they can't support the work that you're doing. And get good at confrontation. I always say, hey, I can give you a hard truth and it doesn't have to feel like a punch. I'm sure there are many people in this room that are way better at that than I will ever be. But I consider hard truths to be hugs, not punches. And I think that healthy cultures need to make space for for tough conversations because individuals need to take the risk of having those conversations in order to innovate, in order to fail so that we land on the big new ideas that are success and innovation. And remember that forgiveness is a skill. We are hard on each other. Culturally, we are very hard on each other. And in technology, you have to fall down and get up and fall down and get up over and over again. And we have to learn to forgive each other and and that requires practice. And it also requires letting go of judgment. And we're all very, very good at that. In technology, there's a big gap between the us and the them, the people that know less about technology. Many fields and industries have similar gap. And any time there's an expertise in the picture, there's an us versus them attitude. But whatever your expertise is, it's your job to communicate with the thems by thinking about the person on the other side of the conversation and by putting them first, you can see how terminology and tone and body language are coming across. You can't treat people inside of an organization any differently than the people uh, inside and still outside of your organization, any different than the people inside and still have a healthy culture. And that's something that's, because hey, hey, in our business, there's, <laughs> I can't tell you the number of times I've heard about the stupid client, right? And we're in a room and the doors are closed and we don't have to say this loud, right? But I was telling somebody today, I grew up with a doctor mother and she always used to say, uh, I'm so sick of hearing about the stu stupid nurse and the stupid doctor, nobody ever talks about the stupid patient. And in my old age, what I have recognized is we are all stupid and we are all in this together and we have to get rid of that us versus them mentality. We have to get rid of it. We are all doing our best. Extend your values to your end process and your products. Your values have to be ingrained in every product or service being offered. Look at Apple's or Zappos. The experience with both of those brands isn't just in the product itself. When I buy shoes from Zappos, I'm not just thrilled with the shoes. I'm thrilled with the experience I had and how quickly those shoes show up on my porch. That is amazing. That's like Jesus works for Zappos. <laughs> so never the us versus them attitude. Always push your boundary, boundaries. And think about a recent experience you had with a company that made you feel good. What did they do? It was simple, and it wasn't the technology that made you feel good. It was the interaction with somebody that was human or something that happened that made it easy for you. It was never the button that you pushed. That's not the thing that you call out. Think of an experience with a company where you had a lousy experience. And then respect others. Compassion, affection, care. They aren't words that we normally associate with work. Certainly in healthcare, they are. But what do they really mean when they're lived and breathed? Always recognize the energy you bring to the room. If you're not wearing a smile, if you walk into the room and you look harsh, this is my biggest peeve. Clients pay us to have good energy. They pay us to come in the room and be excited about getting to work with them. If you walk in the room and you've got that face and that energy that's flat, you have killed it. You have killed it. And you start the entire engagement on the wrong foot. Ultimately, it's a combination of what you bring to your experience and your relationships and what organizations make space for and encourage. What I always say every single day is you have to have fun at work. 
When over 15,000 employees across industries were surveyed, personal accountability was the highest in workplaces that had cultures of love and joy. And that came from that Barsaid study. Keep your promises because we're all only as good as our word. But more than anything, and this is the thing that when we talk about culture, we don't do a really good job of. We have a responsibility to create a place where people want to be. We get distracted by things like flexibility and telecommuting. We think letting them go home is what's creating a great workplace. But what we're really trying to do when we're talking about culture is create a place where they want to be, where they want to show up and collaborate and engage with each other and do novel and innovative and interesting things that will change the world. That isn't about telecommuting. That is about working together and sharing energy and being together and respecting each other. That is where miracles happen. If you look at Best Buy, you know, nobody talked about results-oriented work environment until about 15 years ago or 12 years ago when Best Buy started doing it. Do you remember this? And they got press. I was doing it 20 years ago, but nobody cared until Best Buy did it. And then you would have thought, you know, Jesus landed in Richfield, Minnesota. Except they were a client of mine. And when I would walk through the halls, nobody was there. Nobody was there. They were all home taking care of their kids. They were all cramming their eight-hour hour days into four days. So what Best Buy failed to recognize is, yes, all workplaces are, in fact, results-oriented workplaces. Letting them go home isn't the thing that makes that any more true. Finding ways to get them engaged is what we want to do. And it's not the desk, and it's not the beer, and it's not the foosball table. It's how they feel. So we started with Jobs and his great quote. I'd like to end with mine. Care. Just to bring it back to Steve Jobs and Apple, there's a reason why people love their Apple products. Cynics can say that it's marketing, but it's way more than that. Products create experience that resonate. And those Apple products feel good. They're an extension of those of us that, how many of you are Apple fanatics? Anybody? You got your iPhone? That is a, that is a thing, right? It says something about you to have an Apple product. They feel good. Yeah, they're just products, but they feel special. Those are the kind of experiences and solutions we get when we're allowed and empowered to be human at work. And when we put people first in everything we do, our patients, our clients, our customers, they're people. They freak out. They have good days. They have bad days. And if we consider all of these aspects of their humanity when designing experiences, we're going to meet them in a far better place than if we focus on a single part of their life, like their diagnosis, or in my case, their website, or their app, or their blood pressure. People want to work with people they like. Clients and colleagues and peers. Technology has changed business crazy. But people still pick business because of you, because of you, because of how you make them feel, because of whether or not they trust you. Your website is not the thing that sells people on your expertise or your value. You are somebody they meet on the street, somebody who's had an experience with you, somebody who knows you, somebody you've saved, whatever it is, people facilitate business. Bringing our whole selves to work respecting other people's whole selves, and creating space for all of that within a culture that's focused on people allows for the energy needed to be creative and to be innovative, and most importantly, to be human. Thank you. So I know a number of people need to leave. It's just after 1 o'clock. I think rather than a break right now, if you can stick around, we have some microphones if you have questions. Nancy's available to stay until 1.30. So why don't we just keep it open because I know how much we're learning today from having this great 
human here with us. So once again, thank you so much, Nancy. And let's just, for those of us that can stick around with some Q&A with Nancy, feel free. If you need to go, of course, uh, uh, please move on uh, with, your, with your life. So thank you again. <laughs> Maybe just raise your hand if you have a question. We can bring a microphone to you. There's one right oh. here. So Nancy, at Clockwork, because um, you're the boss, um, you have tough decisions you have to make. You have things that don't always work the way you want them to. And so what are, kind of as a leader, what are your practices or the tactical things you do that help you stay focused on the humanity piece? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think because it's so ingrained and it's something that we talk about often, um, it's an easy thing to stay focused on. But one of the things that I, I, I have learned to do is just be much more transparent in how tr uh, decisions are made. Because I think it's easy for people to revert to old habit or they bring their old baggage into work. And they want to, you know, I have people that don't look me in the eye because of my title. Um, or imagine that somewhere in a room the man is making decisions, um, you know, that impact them. Uh, and the man doesn't actually care about them. And I have to remind them that I am, in fact, the man. Um, and, and I t walk them through how decisions are made. So recently we made a change to our parental leave policy. And I talked about how we thought about it at the staff meeting. And my, my employment attorney told me not to do that. And you know who my employment attorney is. Um, and I decided to just reject that advice and walk them through it. Um, and they were really receptive. And they understood why we made one decision over another and how it would you know, what it would cost the company um, and what the ultimate benefit was to um, the staff. So it worked really, really well. But I guess that's it. It's like, I sort of feel like I have more uh, transparent conversations with the staff on a regular basis. So Nancy, I've got a question for you. Um, Hi. Clearly you've got, uh, you know, an amazing culture and, and, you know, you've got your sacred things. and. And I know that you also have a very rigorous um, interview process. Uh -huh. But can you say a little bit about your onboarding process? How do you immerse a new employee um, into your culture? Sure. Um, we've had employees tell us that we've got, for a small company, we have one of the better onboarding processes they've ever seen. So we, we have a talent development manager. So instead of having an HR person, the HR function happens through sort of finance. So all of the administrative tasks of HR happens there. Um, and then our talent development person has worked pretty extensively on putting together our orientation materials. So we have the first two weeks for every new person is entirely plotted out. They know exactly where they're going, who they're talking to, who they're shadowing, what they need to read, what they need to bring, how they should prepare. Um, it's rigorous, but it does everything from talk them through sort of the tactical expe expectations of the jobs um, and sort of the emotional expectations. So there's a lot of narrative blog posts that I've written over the years are all sort of collected in that place. Um, the values that we articulate are all collected in that place. Um, how we conduct staff meetings, who you talk to about what, all of that is all available online in our our uh, new employees move through it in the first two weeks with the help of that talent development manager. Does that answer the question? Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Um, first, I'm just wondering if you're hiring. We are. <laughs> we are, and for everything, but where do you work? Here? I'm just kidding. I work here at the Center for Innovation. Okay, well, you're fine. I know. I'm you're lucky. You're fine. I saw your stuff. You're fine. <laughs> um, thank you for that presentation. You've done an amazing job of really transforming our ideas of professionalism, but I'm curious how and whether or not that limits some of the clients that you're able to work with, those that get you versus those that may not be there, or how do you set expectations around 
you know, how you're going to work and who you are and, and things like that? Yeah. I think that's a great question because I think we imagined that our culture would alienate some clients when in fact we are a vacation for clients that we would expect to alienate. So um, it's interesting because even in our space we have like the room that's conservative and then the room that was, was you know, designed by an artist who I'm not sure what he was on but it was thrilling, whatever it was. Um, and we bring our more conservative clients to the, to the conference room that we think they'll feel more comfortable in and then they get a glimpse of the green room with the crazy sculptures. You've, have you seen the green room? It's crazy. Um, and they always say, how come, how, come we, how come we didn't have our meeting in there? So I think, you know, we project onto other people what we imagine um, their reaction to us might be and it never really is. So I think at the end of the day, most of our clients fit because we're able to solve their problem, not because our workplace matches theirs. Um, and more often than not, they want to get ideas from us about how to work differently and better. Um, and they want ideas that aren't just the perks, you know, because they may not be able to get a, uh, and, and we hear that all the time, well, it's, it's, you're, you can do that because you're an internet business. Like, you can do that, right? And I always say, well, it, you don't have to adopt everything we're doing, but just start with maybe team dynamics or having open conversations or, you know, we have a, a monthly lunch that we call fellowship. And, you know, it's me sort of reporting into the whole staff about how we're doing and how we're feeling and what we're working on. And then we all sit around and just hang out with each other. You know, that doesn't require a lot of change in culture. It just gets people in the same room celebrating. But our clients tend to really like it, and we work with some really conservative clients, um, and they think it's fun. But yeah, a long time ago, I, I, I thought, well, we have to pick and choose. Now, I will say that we, we want clients that match our values. So, you know, we've certainly had people show up and um, uh, ask us to work on products that um, we're just so far away, and I'll tell you what some of them are offline if you're really curious, but just really like offensive material online or what have we won't do that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I just heard that on the way in. I was like, oh God, yeah. really? Two weeks ago? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We start to um, challenge those assumptions about what it means to lead and what it means to care. Uh, we could really transform the conversation in, in healthcare, but we're up against. I totally agree. That pantyhose thing. Hmm. You can apply at my place, but I can't apply at yours. I haven't seen pantyhose. In, well, I've never seen them actually. <laughs> <laughs> just I don't even. I don't even like saying the word. That's just a weird word. My question actually was playing off Andrea's as well and about, you know, we have a 150-year culture. Yeah. And we have 70,000 employees. Uh-huh. And, and we can take small steps like not having to wear a pantyhose, which is amazing, by the way. I've had <laughs> naked legs for seven days in a row. Um, Hot but, damn. <laughs> but <laughs> how, how, how do you do it? I mean, how, how can we take Mayo Clinic and, and turn the big ship and be more that way. I, I, compassion is one of our core values, but but how do you bring it back to the workplace in a really effective way at well, that scale? Yeah, I mean, I always say that I don't work for a big company, but I work with them. So it it gives me the the you know I have the privilege of working with some great organizations that do amazing things, and then I have the joy of getting in my car and going home. Um, because most big organizations are clown cars and most of that is around, I'm sorry, um, most of that is because of culture. And, um, and I think, you know, it's interesting, you say compassion is one of your core values and I imagine when most people think about living that, they're thinking about how they are with the people on the outside who come in for service but they're not thinking about how, and that's, 
the whole reason for this talk, right? They're not thinking about how compassionate they are with each other. And they're not thinking about how we value diversity. And I think when we talk about diversity, we have a really narrow view of what that is. And diversity is a lot of things. And we're seeing it all the time. The problem is we're trying to sort of repress stuff. Like, we haven't talked about change and work culture since we were industrialized. It's why we all look, you know, it's why workspaces look the way they do. It's why people gasp when they see your lovely, refreshing, green space, right? Because it's so airy and simple and the lines are clean and it feels good. It feels good here, right? And they can't imagine, but work still looks like the pens we put people in when we industrialized and all we wanted to do was like count the number of widgets they made. And we have a hard time shifting. And I, I think that's kind of crazy, but you and I talked today about some work that I did at IBM, and it was the same thing. I went in and I talked to 250 designers about how to talk to 30,000 engineers that have been there for 30 years and always done things, you know, the same way. And I think it is the little changes. I think it is the team changes. I think the Center for Innovation is the change for Mayo, right? Um, I think you're the shining light that people are going to start looking at, and they're not just going to say, why can't we do what they're doing? They're going to say, well, you know, they seem happy. Like, they're going to start looking at you as a test case for what culture can look like. And, um, and I also think uh, people and personal brands are really powerful inside of large organizations, and if you have a voice and you can use it outside of the work that you do every day, um, that's a really powerful thing, you know? When I was talking to those designers, I was talking about the power of blogging through their experiences because they were each assigned to, um, a, a, so a single designer was assigned to a single engineer and suddenly they were supposed to be a team. And I suggested that they start talking about their collaboration in an open space that other people could use and learn from. And suddenly, you know, they've got this shared initiative, this shared desire and you know, maybe they can build friendship or connection around that, but it's it's little incremental changes, um, and then amplifying the message around what those changes actually do and how they make people feel, and that's sort of the sad story about larger organizations. But hey, pantyhose, woo! <laughs> Nancy, um, hi, my name is hi. Kelly and I also work at CFI here at Mayo Clinic. But I especially loved your slide that said, make space for tough conversations. And um, that the more we do it, the better we'll get at it. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and how you create safety for those conversations and um, help promote them so that we, your, your um, teams can get better at doing them. Yeah, that's the toughest challenge, I think, for any organization. And, you know, it goes back to kind of what I said. We don't like to hurt each other's feelings. We're super scared of, like, treading in other people's territory. Um, and I think it's just, I always say that my job is not about ever teaching anybody anything new. It's just reminding them what they already know. Um, and so I do think that sometimes you have to continually remind people how necessary those conversations are. And then I think lead by example. And you know, we're a small business, so we're going through this interesting process um, that is based on these books called Traction. Um, you guys have all probably read Traction, Gino Wickman's Operating System for Business. And it's only small business, but the interesting thing he does is he um, sort of uh, uh, makes you identify a visionary inside of your organization, and then the only thing you do with that visionary is you use them for 911 calls, right? I mean, other things, but, but you call them when, when stuff goes off the rails and somebody has to communicate something difficult. Um, so that's my job, and I say that you know, my, my entire existence is about crushing people's dreams and doing it so that they still feel the love. Um, and I think it takes practice. You know, I think it takes practice and, um, and leadership. I think you have to be able to do it. You have to demonstrate how to do it and, um, and then invite people to the table to do it too. And I also think consequences and judgment, you know, like what happens if they do it wrong? Well, they still have a job, right? And judgment, they may not do it the way you do it, but the issue is, is the outcome appropriate? Like, did you communicate the message? Because um, we have a, you know, I know it, it, in small businesses, leadership has a tough time letting go. 
And that's probably our biggest problem. It's hard to scale because, well, nobody does it better than me. I'm awesome, right? But in order to get good, you have to have other people that can have those hard conversations. And, um, and that's when mentorship is a good thing, too. So I think it's just people leading other people. Yeah. Would anybody like to ask me about pantyhose? <laughs> Clearly an expert. I can't believe I just said pantyhose like seven times <laughs> for the first time in 30 years. Oh, really? Really? <laughs> I mean, what's to talk about? I just said be human, be nice, make products that people like and can use. There should be no questions. Okay, here's my question. So you have that exhaustive hiring process, screening yes. process, then you have uh, deep, deep orientation mm -hmm. and onboarding. Mm -hmm. And a few months later, you figure out, oh, that wasn't such a good hire. That oh, person yeah. doesn't fit our culture. Mm -hmm. We How just stopped talking to them. Really? Yeah, There's just ostracize them, them, pretty much. Yeah, that. <laughs> Wait for them to go we away. Just pretend they're not there. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I mean, we ha you, have to, you have to fire fast, right? And, um, and, and I'm... I'm a fan of the truth, and I think they know it too. You know, when somebody's not a culture fit, it's uncomfortable for everyone. And I think the sooner you make that shift, the better you are. Culture is everything. It's everything for us. So if they don't feel right, yeah. we all know. Okay, what if they feel right and they just can't do the job very well? Yeah. Um, so we do what any business does, right? There's performance plans, and then they either show up or they don't. And that's the, I mean, it's a business. At the end of the day, it's a business. So um, we have expectations of those people. We clearly articulate those expectations. If they don't show up, they can be, I can want to hug them till I, you know, till I, till I retire. <laughs> but I can't keep them. So, but you know, we say in, our, in our, our job postings and everything we do, we need high performers. Like, don't show up if you, don't, if you aren't somebody who takes initiative and can drive. And, you know, and, and, I'm, and we say it over and over again, like the people that uh, conduct meetings at Clockwork, if you don't bring, like that energy thing that I said was my peeve, it is my peeve. If you don't walk into a room and bring great energy and make them feel good because they get to work with us, I will come in and bulldoze you. I will bulldoze you because somebody is going to make those people feel like they won the jackpot because we're all in the room together. And it's, it's stuff like that, you know. Um, so they can have the right job skills, but if they don't show up, um, they got to go. Are we done? Hallelujah. <laughs>